Chapter 30 Rebecca was alone now. Glaceon was dead. The refugees had fled. Only the dead and dying remained in the manor rig. Only Glaceon and his ilk, and Rebecca and hers. As the rumble below receded, the rumble above approached. It was a deep, immemorial sound. Hundreds of millions of tons of rock ground to grains of sand, and those grains in turn burst to leave only the dry husk of matter. It was the sound of life dissolving into death, and it approached. It's going to grind our bones, Glaceon, Rebecca said with dry compassion. It's going to grind us away to nothing, she patted his side gently. Then we won't be alone anymore. There was a warmth beneath her hand. Glaceon's side was warm. A breath of hope hitched in her throat. Could it be? She touched his chest. It was cold and still. She touched his neck. The flesh was as algid as a meat in the cellar. There was no pulse. Her hand retreated again to his side. It was feverishly warm. What is this? She drew a white cloth from the black wound in his side. Beneath its savage stitching, the outline of the Phyrexian heartstone was obvious. Heartstones were uncharged crystals, though. This stone glowed with heat and light. Eyes cold in the dim chamber, Rebecca felt along the inside of the healing capsule. Her hand settled on a slim case of implements. She opened them, finding three scalpels. The smallest flashed in her fingers. It sliced open the mound of flesh. Gods! The skin split back like the desiccated rind of an old orange. Out tumbled the two fist-sized stones, deeply red and sparking faintly in the murk. Ropey lines of blood clung to them. Rebecca poked one stone away from the wound. She edged it up onto the white rope. It glimmered with the mantle of gore. She nudged the other stone up beside it. A charged heartstone! Yamoth implanted a charged stone in him! She murmured incredulously. Even she, who felt Yamoth crawling through every tissue, even she was surprised by this treachery. He had removed a charged sliver and replaced it with a charged stone. With two stones. No wonder Glaceon had died. The roar above grew suddenly louder. It would not be long now. Flinging away the scalpel, Rebecca savagely stepped at the two crystals. Congealed blood draped her wrist. She didn't care. The stones were warm. A gentle light danced with them. The same gentle light in each. They were not two stones, but two halves of a whole. Wiping the jagged edges against her husband's robes, she lifted them, lined them up, and slowly brought them together. As the halves neared each other, the light in them intensified. What seemed only a failing spark became a flickering flame, and then a whirling flame. The crystals glowed. They beamed. Jags of energy arched between them. With each jolt, the heat increased. Blood dried, burst into quick flames, and blazed away. The heat was excruciating. Rebecca thrust the halves together. They met. Shorn edges joined and fused. The separate places in each half fled together and ignited a white-blue radiance. It was blinding. It was searing. It illuminated the whole manor rig. Those who lay dying moaned, thinking the white cloud had set upon them. Rebecca tried to shy from the radiance. She collapsed, but the thing was still clutched in her hands. It would not release her. A mind spoke to her out of that crystal. A mind that has been split in two. Darling, I am here. She could not respond. She was terrified. It is I, Glaceon. How? How can you be here? Empty power stones absorb great energies. They take on the properties of the energies they absorb. This stone had absorbed my power, my personality, my mind. It is charged with my mind. A planeswalker, Rebecca said in remembrance. I had that destiny within me. Yes, though it was never realized. But it lives on in this stone. The light was beaming. So warm. She did not want to think of the coming cloud. Yes, you live on. You must descend, Rebecca. We must descend. She never thought she would hear this. Not from Glaceon. No. Yalboth is a monster. We cannot join him. A laugh came from the stone. Glaceon's derisive laugh. Of course not. We can only descend to trap him forever. What? He will try to return. He wants to rule Dominaria. He wants to rule the whole multiverse. But Dominaria first. It is his holy land. Once the Null Moon has drawn off the Mana Clouds, he will try to return. Yes, of course he will. But we can stop him. You and I. How? The stone he implanted in me. This heartstone. It was Yalmoth's idea of poetic justice. 
This is the crystal Dyfed used to open the portal to Phyrexia. Recharge and rejoin. The crystal can seal the portal forever. Oh, Glaceon. I will be the gatekeeper. You need Mirror to set the crystal on the mirror podium, and the portal will close. I will remain, keeping Yamoth and his monstrous nation locked away. He is no planeswalker. He will not escape his Phyrexia. His world will become his prison. Oh, Glaceon, I can't sentence you to do that. To an eternity alive and alone in the stone. It will be a long eternity. Yes, my dear. But a glad one, knowing Yamoth's torment. Again came that raking laugh. And knowing the world, the multiverse, is safe from him. I was right about him. I was right all along. Yes, and we were wrong about you, Rebecca said. You were always a conundrum, but a good man. A very good man. And I loved you. Then you weren't wrong about me. His presence for a brief moment seemed to wrap around her. There was a fleeting, ephemeral kiss. And I loved you. Now, you must descend. We must banish Yamoth once and for all. Yes. The refugees had passed all through the portal. The few who had fled away had already been hunted down and slain by artifact creatures. Their bodies were still warm when they reached the flesh vats. More shiny machines waited at their post, ordered to chase down any creature that emerged from the portal. Yamoth sighed with pleasure. Minotaur muscle, dwarven pragmatism, elven longevity, feline grace, reptilian armor, the Phyrexians would benefit greatly from their fallen foes. Even now, the priests slice and categorize and pickle their flesh. Hamstrings and femurs, brains and hearts, livers and spleens, emptied into the grinders. All was right with the world. Yamoth was in heaven. He sifted down through the spheres of Phyrexia, heading for the heart of the world. It ached for him. Phyrexia had received tens of thousands of new souls, and it was glad, but it ached for Yamoth. Yamoth could not bear the separation either. He arrived in the inner sanctum. Phyrexia received him. It swelled gladly around him and took him into its heart and drew him up and out. Yamoth exulted in the transformation from man to God. He left Phyrexia best just then, as he ascended through her into glory. The walls of numbness thinned and at last became but slender membranes. Through them passed every desire, every fear, every hope and dread in the world. It was a populous place now. He delighted in the souls before him. He examined them, held them in his hands, but into them as sapling peers into a marketplace. Every sensation, every passion infused Yamoth. For a time, he was glad and sated and vast in his world. Then he remembered Rebecca. She was not in the inner sanctum. In his delight, he had forgotten her. He was so accustomed to entering his world this way, alone, and was so ecstatic with his transformation, he had forgotten she should have been here. He longed for her hatred, her all-consuming hatred. He longed to climb through her being and possess her and feel her hatred. It was as delicious as love. Where had she gone? Rebecca was not in the inner sanctum. She was not in Phyrexia. He asked his world. Phyrexia showed him what Rebecca had done, how she had slain the rebellious fat priest, had taken Glaceon to Halcyon. So, she was dead. Rebecca and Glaceon both. The thought made a small, flat regret in Yalmoth's soul. He would miss their hate. It was disappointing. A hatred that powerful could stab out even from the grave. Suddenly, Yalmoth knew. He knew what they would, what they must do. It was not regret, but panic that flooded through him as he pulled away from his world. He descended from divinity to humanity and flung his being out of the portal. Rebecca approached the portal, terror filling her heart. All around, Yamoth's metal defenders crouched, ready to spring. She staggered toward the mirror podium. Beyond, Phyrexia beam, sun bright, blue skies, gray mountains, emerald forest, and golden plains. For a moment, she wondered how she could choose death over such a life. Their eyes settled on the vast mushroom city. Figures moved there. They thronged the streets. Herds of cattle stripped, branded, sliced open, fitted with heartstones, made it to loyal Phyrexians. Death would be far sweeter. She strode forward. Every house guard was busy with the harvest. None remained beside the portal. She reached the mirror podium. It is time, Rebecca. Seal it away. Forever. Yes, she said quietly. It is time. Why do you wait? Urged Glaceon within the stone. I want to see the sky for just a moment more, she said sadly. And touch you a little while longer. The moment I seal the portal, 
I am alone in the darkness. You need never be alone again. Never be in the darkness. Suddenly silhouetted against the bright sky stood Gelmoth. He was tall and beautiful in his world. His eyes were bright as the stars. His cloak swirled about him. Come join us. Come, receive me. Now, Rebecca, seal it before he steps through to drag you in. He won't step through, she said confidently, loud enough for Yamoth to hear. He won't risk being trapped on this side, where he is only a mortal man. He wants me to live with him. He doesn't want to die with me. Put down the stone and come with me, Rebecca. I offer life, abundant life, eternal life. Leave the dead man in his dead world and come with me. Close the portal. Why do you wait? Do you want him to tempt you? I want to see the sky, Rebecca said. I want to touch you, to hear your voices. Voices? The moment I close the portal, I will be alone in the darkness. You loved him? You loved him too. I want to see the sky a moment more. Come, join us. Live, Rebecca. Live. Goodbye, sky. Goodbye, husband. Goodbye, Yarmouth. Goodbye. No! She placed the stone in its mirror scone atop the pedestal. The crystal released her hands, Glaceon's last touch. No sooner was the stone in place than light flared through the cave. Long crystals in the ceiling blazed. Lightning surged outward along the wires that spread from the pedestal. All around the room, the metal guardians of Phyrexia came to brief life. Sandcrabs snapped their claws as energy clawed around the carapace, the shimmering curtain of the portal wavered and began to fade. With a sudden quiet snap, it was all gone. Sky, Phyrexia, Yamoth, Glaceon. The lights over her blinked out. The mechanism shivered to a halt. Where the portal had been, only a wall of stone remained. Before the wall, in its mirror pedestal, the power stone glowed quietly. It seemed a pair of hearts, pulsing in synchronous beats. Yama's final shout echoed away in the caves of the damned. Alone in the darkness, Rebecca turned and walked. She left the caves behind forever. Rebecca ascended the long, torturous path out of the darkness. Into a cloud of white, she ascended. This concludes the Thran unofficial audiobook by J. Robert King. This is a narration production by Coach from the Carbazar. Make sure to subscribe to the Carbazar for more unofficial audiobooks and Magic the Gathering content.